So welcome to Chapter 7, Development Strategies, Part 1 for CIS 244. So we'll cover these outcomes. We'll talk about software as a service, which you should be familiar with. Web 2.0, you've heard me mention. I think we're well past that idea of Web 2.0. We're definitely heavily embedded into cloud computing and getting more with each day. So we'll look at the rest of these outcomes throughout this lecture. Go ahead and pause and read through these outcomes. We'll talk about RFP and RFQs. And I'll give you some examples of why those are so important. So development strategies certainly have changed. You know, a few years ago, yes, companies either developed software in-house or purchased a software package or hired consultants to perform the work. Today, though, however, we reach out to third-party vendors, application service providers a lot more. You know, great example would be, you know, Amazon services. Amazon has a plethora of hosting services and pre-built applications to help companies run their business. Microsoft is pushing towards Azure server. You might want to do some research on that Microsoft Azure, where we can dynamically put a server in the cloud literally within minutes to support web hosted applications. Web hosting, we see companies turning to that. We see Microsoft turning away from selling you Exchange Server to hosting your Exchange email for you in Office 365, giving you Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and other things online. We see QuickBooks going from having you either download QuickBooks or go get a disk to managing your entire financial information through the web, through the cloud, for examples. So firms that offer enterprise-wide software solutions, we're also seeing a lot of these ERP systems now be placed in the cloud so that we're not having to build local infrastructures that support databases and et cetera. We actually are purchasing and utilizing those technologies from the cloud. And that, of course, changes our requirement and dependence on high quality bandwidth through an internet service provider. So, you know, again, companies must deal with the impact of the internet, software outsourcing options in-house. And then there's the complexity as, as we outsource all these things, making sure they work together, bringing them together, sharing data across networks, training users on how to use them, a lot more challenges from an IT standpoint, we may not be managing the server, touching and feeling it in our location, but we still need to know how all the networking works, how to troubleshoot. So when we call these customer service lines and say, hey, our system's down, we might have some information as to why. So the prediction by Gartner Group, SaaS will reach a 14.5 billion in 2012. Of course, software as a service, one of the huge growing areas is actually the technical support. A lot of companies now are using um, technical support companies in India, for example, uh, to do their level one, level two end user technical support, you know, adding users, changing permissions, um, you know, things like that, turning off user access, configuring things so that their internal IT staff can work on the more tougher direct on hands things that need hands-on work so so as you can see you know 14.5 billion 2012 you know revenue will grow in 2015 to 22.1 and it may even exceed that so as we talk about development strategies we have to look at that traditional development of you know influenced by compatibility issues we had to develop for mac we had to develop for pc or unix or linux um, you know, we limited the, the foundations that the software could run on. Those were limitations we had to take into account. And as we move it to the web, you know, we're adding a middle tier for processing and then doing a presentation tier within a browser that may be supported on multiple operating systems because the browser is independent of the operating system. Now, of course, you know, Google has their browser with some dependence in it. Microsoft has their browser with dependence in it, but you get the idea. So uh, systems utilize internet links and resources, you know, cloud-based computing versus local in-house um, development. Again, you know, main paths were in-house development. We had to hire all the 
all the programmers and the consultants and the systems managers and the um, uh, systems analysts, etc. We could purchase software, possibly modify it with the with the software company's permission. A lot of times, if we modified it that limited our support because we suddenly had a unique product that did not match the product that they originally developed and supported. So a lot of costs can go into that. And of course, use outside consultants who would come in, understand our business process, similar to the Susan Park of the personal trainer. More on, uh, so web-based, you know, systems development, we started getting into .NET frameworks, which is a unified framework. If you're not familiar with .NET, the idea was, whereas before we'd have to program an entire application in C or a entire application in VB.NET or a entire application in C Sharp, um, with .NET, we could get programmers who were versed in certain languages. They would write their components in those languages and we would compile them universally. Um, into the software application. So we didn't have to have everyone necessarily working on the language um, of the program, but instead the language they were comfortable in. So uh, Treats the Web definitely is a platform as we see. Just think of all the things that have gone to the web, things that you use via the web today. So easily scalable, as we've talked about before. Um, you know, network load balancing so we can dynamically add more resources as we need them. Um, we're building these products to be scalable. So as before we built products, you know, like a company might build a web-based application for a specific company. Now, as they build it, they go, okay, what if more companies want to use this? Or what if this company grows? We need to build that scalability into the application and they're doing that. So. Um, used for customer relationship management, order processing materials. Those are all part of ERP systems. So CRM, customer relationship management, OP or, you know, or order management, materials management, you name it. All of these systems now are able to link, you know, through standard interfaces into other systems. So suddenly, whereas we would have to call up a manufacturer to get information about the products and services we may have ordered, now we can just get a portal into their site if they allow us. We can see where our order is. You know, a great example of this would be, look at how much information you get from Amazon um, as to an order you placed. You know, when it's confirmed, when it's doing this, uh, when it's shipping, when it's packaged, you name it. It's, uh, it is what it is. So treatment uh, treats the software again application as a service that is less dependent on the desktop computing environment. And as a service, that means we can turn it on and off more easily. So one of the great advantages here is, is we can actually test drive a piece of software, um, you know, without the commitment of buying it and investing in it, if that makes sense. So, you know, we might try different email applications online find the one that works for us and have spent very little money to find the product that works for us versus having to go through a whole process of, of research, et cetera. We can actually prototype or test drive software. So we talked a little bit about middleware, you know, definitely communicate existing software and legacy systems. The idea is if we want old data sitting on old systems to be presentable to the web, we build a middleware that would process the data from the old system, present it out to the web. So involving trends, you know, web 2.0 on enhanced interactive experiences. You know, it's funny, we're seeing all this. Think about social networking. Think about what you could do on MySpace and now what you can do on Facebook and what you're going to be able to do in the next fad that comes along. Who knows, maybe Facebook will be around forever, but maybe it won't. Maybe there'll be something better and a new way that everyone wants to interact. Maybe Facebook will figure it out first. So the growth of outsourcing, definitely uh, there's substantial growth in outsourcing, especially as application service providers have become more prevalent. Um, we pay that monthly or annual subscription fee. We're able to cancel. One of the challenges that you need to think about though, when you consider software as a service is who's hosting my data how do I get my data back if I want to get off the service? So how would I, you know, what's the, what's the process for 
getting all of my emails off of that email server so that I don't lose anything as I transfer to a new email service provider, for example. Internet business services, you know, managed hosting. Folks can, you can still buy your email server, for example, you can host it in a hosted environment. Um, you know, you can build a whole network now, a whole local area network in a hosted environment like Azure. You know, oh, I need a SQL server. Oh, give me a SQL server. Boom, there's a SQL server. You know, I can host my website. I can do all these amazing things. So web-based support for transactions such as order processing, billing, and like I said, customer relationship management. So as we talk about CRM, I would ask you to go out pause this video, go out and just Google salesforce.com. Salesforce.com was really the first company to offer customer relationship management from a hosted service, meaning your data was held by them. You got to the information through a web interface. You got to the information through applications that were available for your smartphone. You know, all in all, just some really amazing stuff happening um, because of companies like Salesforce who thought ahead of the game. So, so check them out and, and get an understanding of what customer relationship management is. It really is the front door to ERP, to enterprise resource planning systems. Um, because if we can't manage customers, can't manage leads, can't turn leads into prospects and prospects into customers, what business do we have? So, you know, outsourcing fees, a lot of ways to go. Uh, hourly, fixed fee, monthly fee, subscription models, um, membership models, you know, which lock us in a little bit further, um, you know, for a cheaper price. So, you know, Google has a system called Google Apps for business and Google Apps for education. And, you know, basically they, they host your email and give you a plethora of applications online that help you run your business. Word processing, spreadsheets, Google, Google, Google Sheets, Google Docs, you name it. Um, and of course, one of the ways that they lock you in is to give you a discounted rate if you subscribe by year versus by month. So usage model or transaction model charges a variable fee based on volume of transactions or operations. Some of you might find in doing your personal trainer project that there's going to be some services out there that they'll actually give you, they say, the software for free, they'll manage, you know, they'll host it, they'll do everything. The way they make their money is they take a certain percentage of all transactions that go through the system. So they're getting paid each time you get paid. Okay, so we see that sort of with credit card company models, credit card processing models, so same kind of thing. You know, outsourcing concerns, uh, you know, mission critical IT systems outsourced if the result is cost attractive, reliable, but what if they fail? If they're mission critical, can we afford to have someone else be responsible for those things that, that manage our day-to-day -day company operations? You know, um, I'm sure you've probably called up a company at some point and they've said, well, my system's down, so I can't serve you. You know, wow, isn't that frustrating? Why is their system down that they can't serve me? Um, is it because it's outsourced? So, you know, shifting IT development, support operations. You know, the fact is certain countries like India and, and overseas are creating expert modules. They're educating their, their folks to be programmers. And so the more programs they write, the better they get at it, the more efficient they get at it. And if we go to them with the right outcomes, with the right requirements, with the right documentation, because they're experts, they can build systems that will work for us better than perhaps systems we can build in-house. Now, I'm not supporting outsourcing or, or not supporting outsourcing. I'm saying in certain cases, there's an advantage to it. And in a lot of cases, in certain cases, mission, mission critical things, there could be a disadvantage. So company's choice is develop its own systems, purchase third party, possibly customize that purchase or implement a software package implement software as a service, okay, which may not be a package that we have to implement in-house. So we should add to this software as a service or, you know, implement a hosted uh, solution via the web. So most important, there we are again with that darn total cost of ownership. 
we really need to look at the costs, all of the costs associated with one choice over the other. So we look at those costs, we analyze them, we decide whether we have the skills, the experience, the time, the resources to do it in-house versus out of house versus getting a product that exactly matches what we need versus getting a third party product that does 80% of what we need. And then how do we do the other 20%? Now, what I would suggest with my experience, what I can bring to, to light is when you implement a software package, you're going to change to fit the package much easier then you're going to get the package to change to fit you. So just something to consider. So I'll go ahead and have you pause on this and you can read through, you know, what the advantages of in-house are. I kind of already covered a lot of these versus purchasing a software package. So you can pause on that, you know, software in-house. Again, if we do have those very unique business requirements, now let's be careful, not just they're not just unique because this is how we do it. They're unique and they provide value from their uniqueness, meaning this is something we do differently than our competition. It is a competitive advantage and it's worthwhile having that same requirement within a system, for example. Okay. No commercial software package can meet unique needs of the business. That is true. Again, we may have to shift our business processes to meet the system because it's going to be very difficult to get a pre-programmed system to meet our business processes. So then we might, again, design in-house. So more on software in-house meets constraints of existing technology. So again, if we have, you know, say some legacy systems that we just simply can't replace that we're building on top of, we may have to build in-house. Internal resources capabilities, you know, we really have to ask, do we have the team? Do we have the experience? Do we have the time? And do we, you know, have the expertise to develop a successful package in-house? So purchasing, definitely lower costs, requires less time to implement, uh, proven reliability and performance benchmarks, only if we go out and make sure that people are currently using the system are happy. So we might, might want to go on some field trips before we purchase the software. Uh, requires less technical development staff, yes, because it should be developed when we get it. We may be able to work with the company, like I said, to modify it and add an additional expense. Those expenses, by the way, might kick over into what we pay annually for a support fee because now they're having to support a somewhat unique system uh, versus their out-of-the-box system. So future upgrades may be an issue. Um, and input from other companies. Again, you can contact users and other companies to obtain their input and impressions. And today we can do a lot of that through forums and, and discussion boards online, you know, just simply asking the question. Currently COCC, I'm on a software um, discovery committee at, for uh, electronic catalog and curriculum process. And we went out, um, one of the registrars went out and posted something on a forum of registrars. Hey, has anybody done this? Have they used this software? What's your thoughts? And we got back invaluable information. So customizing a software package. Well, you know, purchase a basic package that vendors will customize to suit your needs. We negotiate with the software vendor. Again, we need to look at how, what is the impact of those modifications on total cost of ownership? Okay. Um, you know, is, is there a different license fee? Is there a different support mechanism? Um, are we going to spend more time on support, et cetera? So this is a great place to stop the first part of this lecture. Um, we'll do the second part, beginning with creating user applications in the second part, as I said, take care.